people will say, where are the women? Where are the women? We don't see them. They can see men who hold the guns, but they don't see women uh, that are bringing peace. So we always ask, what is the peace table? Is it really a gun table or is it a real peace table? Hello and welcome to this episode of He Stands for Peace, the podcast series that explores the state of the women peace and security agenda in Africa through a series of dialogues with key actors. I am Dr. Yemisi Akimbobola, your host, and today I'm joined by Madam Binetta Diop, the special envoy on women peace and security to the chairperson of the African Union Commission. The focus of this episode is localizing peace. Thank you for joining us, Madam Diop. Would you like to start by telling us about yourself and your role as Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yemisi, for your kind invitation. I'm delighted to have uh, this conversation with you on uh, Women, Peace and Security. You know, uh, let me first of all recall the um, landmark resolution uh, 1325, 1325 which have been adopted by the UN Security Council, which is now well known as the Women, Peace and Security agenda everywhere, not just in Africa. But it's also important that Dr. Yemise, we also remember that 1325 is bought in Africa. It has been a Namibian instrument when they were sitting at the Security Council, the meeting they organized in window, which gave birth to this landmark resolution. So um, let me just say that if it is born in Africa, it has been also part of many African legal instruments. The Maputo Protocol, the Solemn Declaration on Gender Equality. So it's not a UN per se only, but it is born in Africa, embedded in our instrument. So it's an African instrument. So I just wanted to say that this is why my mandate start from. Let me again say something. When I was appointed special envoy, and I would say it's not surprising that Africa become the first continent to appoint a special envoy on women, peace, and security, because it's an African instrument, as I reminded ourselves. So under the leadership of Dr. Kosazana Plaminizuma, who was then the chairperson of the African Union Commission, and then under the leadership of Musafaki Mohammed, I had the privilege, the honor, I would say, to hold this mandate given by both Madam Zuma, but also Musafaki Mohammed. So uh, let me again say uh, being privileged, but it's a demand of the women of this continent. Since Beijing, 1996, from the Africa Peace Tent, some of us who have been in Dakar for the preparation of Beijing, you know, so the women were there from conflict zone asking for their protection, asking for their participation, asking to be part of prevention and post-conflict measure. So you will see that the demand has been a long standing demand on uh, women, peace and security. So uh, my mandate resonates with uh, also my long time commitment and engagement with women in conflict. I create from Farm Afrik Solidarity, and um, I have been working with women in conflict zone. So this mandate provides me with an opportunity to echo the voices of the voiceless, my sisters that are affected by conflict. Thank you very much, Madam Diop. And it's very clear that you've got a very long history of involvement in the Women, Peace and Security agenda in Africa yourself, even before you came on as Special Envoy. So over that time, you've obviously come across several exemplary initiatives. How would you describe those, those, some of those exemplary initiatives that you've come across in that time? Going to conflict zone at that time in 90. Uh, 96 
1997, you know, we saw what was happening in Liberia. We saw what happened in uh, Sierra Leone, what happened in the Rwanda, in the genocide, and in the Great Lakes. So um, I will start by giving you one example that I'm familiar with, as I was also in, involved in that um, initiative, uh, the women of Manu River. You know, Manu River is Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And you know those regional conflict, which is still seeing, because conflict no longer is not an internal, but is also external. It's become regional. So um, at the peak of the crisis, of their crisis involving those three countries, the women of Mano River stood up and uh, did shuttle diplomacy. You know, at that time, I recall that the UN was even ready to pull out and re remove their personnel. So they call on the women. Where are the women of those countries? But they were already doing shuttle diplomacy. So the women went to, nobody was crossing the border, but they were the first to cross to go to Liberia, to go to Sierra Leone, to go to Guinea, to alert the whole leadership of those countries to say, we don't want war, we want peace. Go back to negotiation. I was with them, supporting them, facilitating them, because they need support. And we African women, we are in solidarity when it is a crisis. We go there, we support them, we travel with them, we give them the necessary equipment so they get involved. And they are the one that the initiative brought peace. They contribute to bringing peace and stability because they forced the three leaders to go back at the table of negotiation. So that was a great initiative I have witnessed. And the first time in the history of the UN the Secretary General was Kofi Annan mentioned on his report the contribution of women. The first time in the history of the UN in the report to say women contributed to bring peace and stability in the Mano River region. Never before in an official document of the UN. So those Mano River women were then awarded the Human Rights Prize because for them, by the General Assembly, by the sec not the Security Council alone, but the entire General Assembly. So that was one of the pillars of 1325, that women can contribute to bring peace if they are allowed to do that. Maybe just a second one that I have also uh, been uh, involved in supporting is within the DRC, the, the, uh, the talks. Uh, which they call the Sun City, the Inter-Congolese Dialogue. You know, I was at uh, facilitating, again, the same way that we facilitate the women of the Manu River, was facilitating for the Congolese women to go to Sun City and be part of their negotiation. And I can tell you that they push for the signing of the agreement. They were the one to be in the corridor, to be part of the negotiation, to push for the, there was a long standing negotiation and they brought peace. And back home in the constitution, uh, they make sure that the, the issue of parity representation was part of that new constitution of the DRC. I think that we have witnessed good practices that women can contribute to peace. But then the problem, uh, Dr. Yemisi, the problem is they are not invited at the table. You know, even that you have seen that good example in the Manu River, the great example in the DRC. Another example I can also give is in Burundi with the President Nyerere and President Mandela. I was also there to support the women for their contribution in the Arusha peace talk. And they made peace. They were part of contributing to build peace in their country. If now those countries are, as we say, silencing their guns, because it's about silencing the guns, 
we can say is thank for the women. Maybe peace is a long-term process that we need to always engage in, but we can say here that those women, either in the Manu River, either in the Great Lakes, have contributed a lot to their uh, peace process. You've identified three really unique initiatives in Africa that have been central to fostering peace in their communities led by women. If we were to unpack these organizations, what would you say are the, are the key local attributes that helped this initiative to achieve the successes that they did? I think uh, the real fact that those women understood the ground, you know, because you need to recognize that you cannot bring peace at the top down. You know, it's a bottom up approach that build, you know, sustainable peace. You need to involve the communities, number one. And the women are from those communities. Let me give you an example. Because when they are going at the table of negotiation, invited or even as observer, whatever uh, statute we gave them, they are delegated by their community. You know, so they have the legitimacy. The others, what they do, they hold the guns. The men, they hold the guns. That's what brings them at the table. The women are coming from the mandate of their communities. They sit, they have an agenda, and they make sure that they are being the one elected or pushed to say, go with this agenda. It's a great attribute. But you know the, what I've seen also, those women, because when you look at the women from Manu River, across border, they the same communities. At this border, the borders are divided by the colonial masses, you know, but they are the same people. They sometimes speak the same language as well. But even if they are different ethnic group, I can tell you that when they sit, they can disagree for a long time mm -hmm. to discuss, just to be able to agree. But when they agree on one thing, the women will stick on that one thing. So the men, they can sit at the table, agree on one thing, tomorrow they dismantle it and go back to square zero. So the reliability for the women, but also their skills, because women, you mediate every day. You are mediating in your family. You are the one with the children to bring peace among your children. You have that naturally the skills. But, you know, you just give them the support that are needed. That's what Farm Africa Solidarity have been doing. We train women for them to understand the dynamics, to do their own mapping, to know the history that the men have, but they don't share. So we need just to accompany them and they will be able to contribute. So for me, there are so many attributes. I'm not saying that the women can be alone at the table, but they have different views that the men, they are in the community. You know, most of the time, the men, when conflict erupts, violent conflict, men, they run away. They, either they are in the army, in the rebels. Women are the ones who stand firmly on the ground. They are the ones also that uh, have been, their right being violated. We have seen massive rape. The case of Rwanda was one in this genocide. I was also involved in supporting the women of Rwanda in their post-genocide and seeing the atrocities. Uh, so now you can understand why the women of Rwanda are leading in the building their institution back. You know, So we know that Rwanda is the first country in the world to have more than 50% in women in their parliament but also more women in the government, everywhere you saw women. So you can understand the plight of the women in the genocide, in their conflict, but now they are put in at, in the, at the front to bring to restore peace and dignity for Rwanda. Now we are talking about not post-conflict reconstruction, but we are talking about economic recovery of Rwanda because women are at the front. So now, if we understand all these attributes of women, if you are a wise government, you are wise leadership, you will make sure like Rwanda and other countries to put women at the front in governance 
you know, hand in hand with the men, but you don't continue to discriminate. A society that mm. discriminates women will be the society that will never evolve when it comes to economic growth, when it comes to development. So we miss the boat when women are discriminated and not involved. And 1325 is about that. And if we're to consider all of these in the international context, and you've touched on that a little bit there, particularly what you said earlier on about the, the fact that these women are part of the local context or have a local understanding, they come together um, and they sense by a community the mandate to fight for or to, to, to push for. So if we consider all of this, these local attributes, the women, the initiatives you've spoken about in the wider international context, what do you see as the gaps in terms of how international donors and communities and mediators, why are the gaps in, in terms of their work with local peace builders and initiatives of, like the ones you've mentioned already? You know, before I go to that, uh, let me just, when I sit at my desk, as uh, the AU Special Envoy, what I realized that we have this great instrument and we have seen that the women are doing, you know, the necessary um, to respond to those crises, but yet there is no accountability, number one. Our member states say, okay, there is a 1325, 1325 resolution by UN and AU have adopted those resolutions but there is no accountability. I would start with that before just going with the needs of the women themselves. So for, for me, it was important to start saying, let's make them accountable. And that's where we started looking into accountability mechanism. But within those accountability, I will um, maybe develop on that if the conversation take us there. But one of it is really the support to those women survivors. I call them the survivors mm -hmm. because those are the first at the front. You need to put measure for protection for those women. You need to put in place laws, you know, the law that protect women and apply those laws. I think that's the number one. If 1325 to talk about protection and you don't protect the women, and how do you protect it? It's locally, it's making sure that policies are there, but those policies, the women understand them, and those policies can be applied for their protection where they come. You know, when you look at all the, the convention, even the Geneva Convention on, on peace and war legal instruments, you will find that in time, even civilian, not just women, need to be protected. So let's put specific law that protect women. This is a number one, and for women to advocate for their implementation. Number two is, as I already mentioned, is making sure that they contribute in the public spheres, in the governance domain. You know, women need to be there in parliament. The women need to be accessing the resources, especially the natural resources. They are in the community, you know, but they see most of those resources being used and misused. So what is the, the share of the women that are in those communities? So let them benefit from what the soil of Africa have been producing and given to the others. So um, you see the, the, the participation is crucial because they will vote the budget in the parliament. They will be ministers uh, as well. They will be ambassadors. They will uh, be the envoy of the, not just their community, but everywhere. So participation of women in a meaningful way and give them position like defense minister, not just a women minister. So giving them meaningful participation for them, they can contribute as an agenda into the development agenda of their economic, of their, of their country is important. But first and foremost, I think those women that uh, we have seen in the field, in development field, in peace and security field, need to be supported. The resources are not there. You know, when you take a peace negotiation at the table, and I always de say, denounce that, the donor community will give the resources 
to those who hold the guns. They are the ones to access the resources that the community, they are putting at the table for negotiation. You go to Sudan, you go to South Sudan. We have to fight to make sure that, you know, a small portion, the tiny portion of resources go to the, uh, to the women for them to be trained. The men are being given all. They are the ones that they give even the places, the hotels, very expensive for them for months and months. I recall that the Buruin, the, the women see, ah, that's why we see that those at the table will be there for long. And we see in the country, you are the one constructing the villas. We were wondering why those in negotiation are in Burundi constructing villas and investing on, you know, infrastructures, and we don't know where the money will come in from. So it means that the money from the table are feeding those who hold the gun, and the women don't hold the gun. They are coming with the constructive agenda. So the international community recognizing the women can contribute to make peace, need also to provide the resources, but create the environment. It's not just about money. It's about creating the environment for them to be able to have access. Access. I think this is the, the word. Access to finance, access to redistribution. When it comes to land issue, because, you know, one of the main cause of our conflict, the root cause is about land, is about natural resources, is, you name them, but give them access, for example, to be in the agriculture sector, for example when they, we are reconstructing. Give them, you know, the possibility for them to look at their agenda, which is about health, reproductive health of the women. You know, make sure that the government prioritize the human security. Human security is about giving them schools for their children. So give them water. When you see what is happening in the Sahel, is a desertification that is happening, climate change impacting on the women. So you need to provide them with, uh, with water, provide them with sanitation, provide, you see that what COVID have surfaced, make us realize right now, is that a huge gap on those systems. Education system, sanitary system, uh, economic system, women in the market. So right now we need to rebuild back better by making sure that women have access. Otherwise, you know, we continue our conflict. We will not silence the gun, but there will be emerging new conflict and new threat that we're seeing in the Sahel that will impact it in other regions. So time to see women ask, you know, and make sure that those agenda which are human security oriented can be part and parcel of our developmental agenda. And that reallocation of resources in an equitable way that really gives women the equity in their roles and positions to make a change is something that I keep coming across over and over again. And I'm curious to know in your position as Special Envoy, has that position allowed you to put some things in place or to have impact and influence in putting some of these mechanisms, accountability mechanisms, equity mechanisms in place? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yemisi, again. I think that was important. When I uh, came at the AU, the first thing I did by mapping the environment is to look into the accountability process. How do we make sure that what we preach is what we also do? We need to make sure that we make action on the ground. And uh, even though there were policies that have been set up, we needed to go on the ground and see. So my method was to go in the field and sit with the women. That was one of the solidarity mission that I told you. And sometime with my sister, Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General, the UN and AU commissioners, all of us going together to assess the situation on the ground. You always need to do that, uh, to look at the situation of the women, but also alert the leadership the government and so on, on those kind of a situation. But also we realize that when we go in such a mission, maybe we found 1325. When I started 
There were 17 countries that have 1325 National Action Plan. And we realize we need more. All Africa need a plan. Our advocacy now brought to have 30 National Action Plan, 3-0. It's not bad. It's uh, more than half of the continent. But uh, we are pushing to have the entire continent to have National Action Plan. But it's not enough to have a National Action Plan. So that's why I presented to the Peace and Security Council, which is the African Union Peace and Security Architecture. We present to them the continental result framework with key indicators when it comes to the pillars of 1325. Protection, as I said, participation, prevention, and post-conflict reconstruction. To say these are the indicators that we can measure progress, with whom we can use to measure progress, including the women that are human rights defenders in the field, for them to be part and parcel of this. So that continental result framework has been adopted by the Peace and Security Council, but also by our member states. So now is implementation. But you know, most of the time, they, we always think that it's donor community that need to implement those. It has to be by our member. They, are, they have the, you know, the key responsibility of implementing national action plan. By doing what? By themselves designing it, making sure that women are part of it in the design, in the implementation, not just gender ministry, but ministry of defense, foreign affairs, etc that that national action plan should be part and parcel of the parliament's you know, review. Because we know that all the development agenda will go to the parliament for review and testing. And we need to make sure that there is also the budget line uh, when they are presenting the WPS, that they, they have also a budget line. It means that Ministry of Finance have to make sure that, you know, they put their money, the resources, the government money in implementing the Women, Peace and Security agenda. So the CRF is the instrument to measure progress, which are putting at the disposal of our member states. And so far, the chairperson of the African Union, Musa Faki Mohammed, have issued the first report on WPS in the continent, based on the CRF. And we are working on a second report, which we will launch very soon, uh, this month. And it's how many now? 20 countries have reported. So we are slowly putting a mechanism for accountability at country level. And we are supporting our member states to make sure that they account for what they have adopted, they accounted for their commitment um, to the world, not just to the women, to Africa, but to the world. So second, what, uh, when I started also, you know, when we go to mediation, people will say, where are the women? Where are the women? We don't see them. They can see men who hold the guns, but they don't see women uh, that are bringing peace. So... We always ask, what is the peace table? Is it really a gun table or is it a real peace table? So um, we um, started by training women because they will say, even they see their faces, and do they have the skills? So men, they never ask if the men that are uh, rebels um, in the bush, if they have the skill to be negotiating. But the women, we give them the skills. We say, okay, let's... Uh, Look at mobilize, give visibility, because you have the skill, but give visibility to your skill. Let's use the media. Let's, uh, you know, because most of the time we are very quiet. We have it, we do it, but we don't account for it. We don't bring it out. So we say, okay, let's give visibility. So what I did at the AU is with the Kofi Annan Center, with the Pan-African Centers, Centers of Excellence in Africa, that are dealing with peace and security, women, peace and security, bring them together to train women with Accord in South Africa, to train women so we can have a pool of uh, experts 
and have a roster to show to the world there is a roster here of African talented African women that you can use, you know, which eventually becomes the FemWise network. So we started with the roster. We start with training roster because my office is really to initiate, to impulse, to make sure that people know that this can be done. And when it is done, so member state can run with it, the women's movement can run with it. So we initiate to show that it's possible, but when it is possible, now we look at the implementation, which we are doing with the CRF. So uh, when it comes to zero tolerance policy again, we also work with our Amisom troops because these are our peacekeepers. Mm. And we are advocating for women to be in peacekeeping operation within the UN, but also within the African Union. But for that, we don't want to see our officers also doing the same thing that the rebel are using, either rape, violence against women, and so on and so forth. So we came with an African Union policy that is really for protection during deployment of our soldiers and make sure that when they are there, they have a code of conduct that they can also implement and obey. So we work with our gender focal point in our different mission to make sure that uh, we respect the zero tolerance policy in our own peace mission. So those are just few examples on what my office initiated and what we are seeing implemented by different. Uh, so as I said, we are the one that, uh, you know, create a space, uh, but we want to make sure that member states now apply. Because now when they are sending troops, we want countries like Senegal, my country, and I work, we are working with them, for example, to make sure that we train our soldiers, female and male, before they are deployed, pre-deployment training, because it's the country itself that have to make sure that they implement those measures. Absolutely. And you spoke earlier on about the different in, in, localized initiatives, plus the work that you do as Special Envoy. So to what extent do you think we've been effective in documenting best practices as well as deploying them? And what else can we be doing in better deploying at local grassroots levels of these best practices? I mentioned that uh, we are not, what is happening, the solutions, that are happening that each one of us can learn from one another. We are not sharing those best practices as widely as possible. And that can be scale up, you know, because it's uh, when you see those solution, you know, which can be on each context, you need to study how to apply them and you study them. So there is a need uh, to look into the ecosystem of women, peace and security. You need a strong, uh, communication. I always say that the media is important as there. We need also the community of knowledge, those who can document, those who are researchers. We need to bring them to research. Um, Africa need those kind. That's why we, my, my office is mobilizing those think tanks, but also the centers of excellence that I already mentioned, for them to get together to research the, the work of the women uh, to be uh, training this new generation for them to understand. If I don't talk about the Manu River women, you, nobody will know about their work. Um, and I will go back to my country, the, the, what we call the Talatan there, the women of there, the women who resisted uh, during the, the colonized period. Nobody knows their stories, very, if you don't research well. So we need to research the women, our heroines, that have been at the front of the war, of liberation war, but also yeah. on uh, decolonization in our continent. Even long, not just in the conflict, the recent conflict, but the past conflict in um, our continent. So I think we need ecosystem to have the media with the younger generation, very much. There are things that are happening, for example, in Senegal, uh, Farm Africa Solidarity is working with the university 
to build a new, the younger generation, give them skills. We have a master program on gender and peace building. Those are things that we need to bring everywhere for the young men also to study the women, peace and security. It's very important that we work with our university. So in a nutshell, I said there are good practices and the women peace builders are out there. We need to support them. They know and for the communication like you uh, can document and show what they are doing. And that's why I really um, appreciate what the office of the UNOAU have done in the new project that they have launched that they, uh, uh, they are making peace and they're showing uh, who are those women so they see the face, what is their story like and how we can support them for them to share their experience. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And my final question to wrap us up for today is what's next for the Office of the Special Envoy on building on the work that you've done so far um, and also partnerships like that with the UNOAU? Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, first of all, the agenda, we are not yet there. As I always said, we, uh, the glass is half full and half empty. We can celebrate some of the success and the face of the women to show them, I think, and this is very important. But in the meantime, we need to, as I mentioned, we need to leapfrog some of those solutions. If we don't, we will not silence the gun, because when I look at the program, of the silencing the gun is about young people, is about women. And I'm sure that with the UNOAU, who have started working with the African Union, uh, that process within the peace and security agreement between the two institutions, I'm sure that we will uh, continue my office to work together and to make sure that we implement together either being in solidarity on the ground with the women at the community level, supporting them, but also working together with the peace and security to show the face of the women and their solution uh, to be adopted and to be uh, supported by our member states. And I think uh, UNOAU have the expertise and um, uh, my office is really, as I said, keen to continue this partnership that we make the benefit, not just the two institutions, but this partnership will generate the um, entire uh, women, peace and security family. Thank you very much for that insightful conversation, Madam Diop. This has been She Stands for Peace, the podcast series that explores the state of the women, peace and security agenda in Africa. Join me for the next episode.